The ideas expressed in the following presentations are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views of ACI or its committees. ACI web sessions are recorded at ACI conventions or other concrete industry events and will be made available for viewing free of charge for one week. Thereafter, they will be archived on the ACI website or added to ACI's online CEU program depending on their content. You can earn continuing education credits through ACI's online CEU program. Visit www.concrete.org to register. ACI conventions provide an opportunity for networking and for keeping up to date with the latest in concrete technology and practices. Our next speaker today is going to be uh, Jim Hintz, he's a PE. He's Executive Vice President of Research and Development of, of Ceratech Incorporated. And he is a chemical uh, bachelor of science degree from Oklahoma, graduate school of business, University of California. Though he doesn't say where in the University of California. They have like 15 or 16. <laughs> Riverside. Riverside. And uh, computer programming in New Mexico. He's developed rapid hardening cements, masonry cements, specialty cements, cement products with over 90% activated fly ash as the main constituent. Uh, represents company with leadership roles in ASTM, ACI, ICRI, ICC, and other organizations. 35 years of experience in management of cement and concrete product development, technical service, process engineering, marketing, sales, just about everything here. We could go on, but uh, in the interest of time, we'll go ahead and introduce uh, Jim, who's going to talk to us today about uh, green cements. Thank you. Thank you. Um, basically, we want to talk about green cements, and when we talk about green, as Charles mentioned a few moments ago, we're also talking about sustainable. And basically, they are largely uh, several different things, and I've captured quite a few of them here, but that doesn't mean it's the total list. Uh, with activated fly act, activated slag, uh, calcium sulfur illuminate, cal calcium illuminate. There also is activated glass, a, a geopolymers. Some people interchange activated fly ash with geopolymers. There is a difference uh, depending on which kind of fly ash that you're talking about. And magnesia or magnesium phosphate, depending on who you talk to, if it's magnesia or PGM. Uh, a little bit of a technology overview first off with the activated. Uh, mostly Class C fly ash, however we could be also talking about uh, some combination of that along with other supplementary cementitious materials such as slag or Class F fly ash and it's been used a uh, number of different ways so this is just an overview of it all. It's basically we're calling it a pozzolan based cement system and uh, produced a dense physical structure uh, comprised principally of calcium silica aluminate hydrates and I'm going to try to get this video to play here aha it's playing um, I'll explain just a little bit of what the delay is here this was originally made in uh, Apple Keynote and now it's playing on a IBM based uh, PC which is quite a quite an accomplishment uh, at any rate uh, we went through quite a few uh, difficulty trying to get the videos to play. But the chemistry behind the approach, back to the ranch here, uh, the part of it is the dissolution and retardation of the uh, calcium oxide component. Calcium oxide is not there in the real world, but we have to express that as something, so we, as we do in all of the supplementary cementitious materials and cementitious materials, uh, CaO represents the calcium component even though it's there in uh, mineralized form for the most part. Uh, it's also soluble silicates, eliminates, and then it recombines for the desired chemistry. Uh, one of the things that can be used as a general use cement all the way to a high performance cement, uh, depending on how much activator you put in this. Uh, this is in uh, uh, with the activated uh, pozzolan cements, 
Other cements that we'll get into later, such as the calcium sulfur illuminate cements, uh, a lot of times are, they can be used alone. And I see Ed Rice is here, and he can tell you way a lot, a lot more about it than I can. But uh, at any rate, it can be used uh, alone, or it is generally mixed with uh, uh, other cements, or possibly supplementary cementitious materials as well, to make all the way from our relatively uh, general use, but a lot of times rapid hardening uh, cement concretes, to all the way to a very high performance cement concrete. Uh, with the way it's done with the way my company does it, Ceratac, is we have admixtures that we use to uh, basically activate the fly ash and also modifiers in there to control the setting time. And these are then added, uh, as hopefully you will see in a few moments here in some videos. Uh, some of the key performance characteristics are the, the compressive strengths, a lot of times the three-day strengths are about 30% of the 28-day strengths, and you get about 80% of the 28-day strengths in seven days, and the 28s can be fairly high. Uh, flexural strengths tend to run a little higher than they do for, say, a straight Portland cement-based uh, concrete uh, with about 20% of compressive strength compared with maybe um, a sixth to a, a tenth with straight Portland. Uh, that doesn't mean Portland is not good but it's just a little different. Um, key performance characteristics, uh, length change, it tends to be very small, uh, about a sixteenth of an inch over about 10 feet. Coefficient of thermal expansion is fairly low, and the heat of hydration is uh, about 30% less than ordinary Portland cement. Again, if I compare it with ordinary Portland cement, those of you who are in the Portland cement business, don't take that as a, as a uh, put down because it's not. We need a benchmark of some kind to compare to. So that's what that's all about. Uh, some of the key performance characteristics, uh, chemical resistant, uh, it tends to be very freeze thaw resistant, uh, scaling resistant, abrasion resistant, corrosion resistant, and ASR resistant. And we can get into all of those uh, uh, with questions, if you wish, or we'll cover some of those in this report. Uh, Echo Max is one of the things that uh, Ceratec uses, and this is not intended to be a, an advertisement, but uh, uh, has high workability, uh, good finishability, very pumpable, and it uh, sets uh, in a very controlled way. Um, it can be a robust material system, uh, cost competitive, sustainable. This one is uh, fairly much carbon neutral in that it uses about 95% recovered or waste material, and about 5% of the rapidly renewable resources. And it does have an extremely dense matrix caused by the, the low porosity uh, of, these, of the uh, concrete mix. Uh, it has superior mechanical and dimensional properties, uh, placed and mixed and finished like ordinary Portland cement. And of course the rapid hardening will be place like uh, you would a rapid hardening product. You need to be ready to, to move on it when you pour it because it's going to get hard pretty fast. This is a, a typical mix design uh, just as a uh, you can see if I can get this to work right. Uh, the uh, sea ash in here uh, pounds per yard about 513 uh, F ash 86 uh, and so on. Water, you'll notice, is pretty low. Uh, tends to run around 20% water cementitious ratio, uh, maybe 0.22. Uh, has run less than that to 0.18 uh, to give a, a slump comparable to uh, five, six, seven, eight inches, uh, depending on what they want in the concrete. Uh, the, these are, of course, the activators that be a 100 and 300. Air will be whatever you want it to be, depending on how much air and training agent you put in it. So it would have an air and training agent if they call for it. The freezing and thawing uh, uh, ability does not require it. But if the, if the regulations and specifications call for it, put it in to get it. Uh, the C ash and F ash can be variable. Uh, this can include some slag or that sort of thing. There are cases of uh, Russians back in World War II. They didn't have enough Portland cement, so they actually make buildings out of activated slack. And so it's been going on a long time. 
In fact, uh, even even earlier than that, a lot of you know this story. The Pantheon in Rome, built back in the Roman, uh, you know, in the times of when the Romans were in, in full power, uh, was made of, of volcanic ash, and, and uh, obviously activators that they had developed. Uh, this is another specialty used cement, a uh, little higher mix for uh, faster setting. You can see the the uh, strength development down there from 24 hours through 28 days. Obviously, more uh, sea ash, more of the uh, activators, and so on. And uh, these are some of the sources of the of the various materials. Uh, this sea ash, for instance, came from a big Cajun plant in Louisiana. Uh, one of the things that we had to do, uh, just a bit of an explanation, uh, this is, again is not intended to be a, a uh, commercial, but when we had to reload the, the videos, a lot of the leader and the trailer and all that came with it. So that had been cut out, but uh, uh, this audience gets the full deal. So, so basically, this is a, a uh, roller compacted concrete in uh, Ohio, and uh, excuse me, it's not from the from Factory countries in Ohio. It's another project for exactly to use uh, regular concrete. Anyway, there is one in here that had a little mix-up apparently in the in the uh, videos, but you can actually see that this is a ready mix for a wall, and uh, the pouring technique is very conventional, very similar to. Uh, pouring inside of a vertical form uh, at any location. And you can see the consistency is pretty similar. Typically when they pour into a wall, they like six, seven, eight inches. And uh, so we give it to them and uh, uh, adjust the activator so that it gives them the concrete strength that they want. And that's with a nominal amount of fly -out. And even with, as uh, you saw a moment ago, with the 513 pound of what he was in class two flash, we can adjust the setting time and the strength development in that, leaving the fly ashes alone, simply by adjusting the amount of activator and modifier, and leaving the rest of the, of the mix alone. And that's what we, and at some of the early uh, mixes that we did, we used a, a uh, Additive system which is on the ground and what we call a shepherd hook to put the activator in the back end. Since then, that has been updated with uh, basically uh, tanks and pumps and so on, so that it's a, an additive similar to what you would use in a ready mix plant for most additives. And I'm going to leave this so that you can see what the relief looks like on these uh, pillars that were poured. This is one using, utilizing a mobile mixer for a full depth slab replacement in Virginia. And basically, this is for situations where one can go in and uh, basically tear out a section of, of uh, road, a freeway, come back in with a mobile mixer and uh, pour that and have it ready for traffic again in just a few hours. And that's been done numerous times. And that was, this would be for the rapid hardening version which is a, uh, usually a higher amount of, uh, of the whole fly ash and a higher amount of the, of the rapid hardening activation. And basically, this, this is a daytime, this is for a demonstration for the Virginia DOT, which is in the daytime. A lot of the actual work, though, is done at night, where the roadway will be cut down, or it could be an airport runway or a, a tarmac. And we'll be shut down at night, and the tear out work will start maybe 9 or 10 o'clock, and then the pouring will start in maybe by 5 o'clock or so the next morning. Traffic will be up and running again. So I'll let that run just a few minutes so you can see what it looks like. And you can see the consistency is, is uh, very similar to what we would do with most other countries. And basically the handle the same, finishes uh, the same way. 
And the only thing is for a rapid hardening, you have the same situation you would for any rapid hardening. You have to be ready to finish it. Once it's poured, you have to be ready to go. And you can see they're standing on one end of this while the other end is being finished. So it hardens pretty fast. Uh, we have one, which is a, a uh, United States Marine Corps uh, Foundation slab in uh, Bridgeport. It did not want to play in this format, so I'll tell you a little bit about that while we're going with this next slide. Uh, basically, the Bridgeport, uh, which is in the mountains of California, was at a location of just four hours from the nearest radio flat. So how do you get radio there and haul it four hours? So we poured out the materials that were going to be utilized and it was installed in a ready to make a truck drop to the uh, uh, mountainous Marine Corps, Marine Corps base and their water and the activators and modifiers were added on site out of, out of sales at that time. And this was done in, in uh, 2007. And it was done at 20 degrees Fahrenheit. And this makes the board and the court in these cold weather hearing conditions. Uh, and it's set up and got all the requirements of the United States Marine Corps. This particular one uh, video here is showing a molten salt pit. And uh, this was done uh, for the handle molten sulfur out of rail cars. And the sulfur fumes obviously were turning into all kinds of uh, all the sulfuric acids to various kinds of or sulfate and sulfite and would actually run out the concrete. And they had tried all kinds of mixes, they tried epoxy coatings and all kinds of things. Nothing worked. Uh, so far, this is the first of this is in 2007. Some recent pictures that I don't have here, uh, taken fairly recently, to show that it's still holding up uh, very fine. They've had no problems. In fact, uh, have gone back for three more uh, iterations. I've had a number of these. Uh, Channels that they pour out of rail cars. Actually, the rail car sits on top of this and dumps out of the rail car with molten sulfur or liquid in the engine, and it's then taken to a large pump, heck of a pump by the way, and it pumps through insulated storage tanks, so then it's sold into the chemical market in the Baytown, uh, Texas area. This particular uh, plant is in on Dallas and Island. So they have the capability to offload ocean going vessels and so on. And that's what it looks like. And then obviously they set rails on where those bolts are. This is a precast concrete demonstration uh, showing what what can happen when in a precast situation. Basically this mix is a self consolidating mix. And uh, as you can see it, it pretty much it runs until it forms all by itself. And uh, because it's, the mix has a fairly sort of high amount of flies and it tends to be a little consolidated all by itself. So making it sit, sit up like for a painting application, you have to make it uh, fairly dry and, and make sure you control the water very well. So this insulation in, in this situation is pulled out on a flat plate on the top of, of this uh, mold and it actually overflows over into the cavity and you can see where the person is finishing it now and then uh, in a while they'll lift that outside of the mold off and leaving the, the hardened material. This is one of the advantages for a pre-cap operation is they can turn their molds over fairly fast with this kind of application and of course they like that and uh, obviously their shrinkage and cracking is very much reduced. Well, he walked it there a moment. This is actually another application where they're making a precast panel, uh, aside from the the uh, round uh, mold that you saw there, just the rectangle shaped mold. And basically, uh, you see it pour out, and it's pretty much seek its own level, and obviously they'll pull it all over them to fill in the corners and the different areas.
and it will sit fairly quickly, finish pretty normally. And uh, obviously you can see the cutout in the, in the mold adjacent to it where they can will actually make cutouts or uh, opening the transitions or whatever they need to, uh, for uh, the requirements for the project. And you see it pretty much just flows itself into the mold. And uh, you'll see when it, when it pulls off later, there are uh, very few, if any, ever honeycombs or, or cavities. Now that I said that, I have to wait until the end of the video so they can see that. See, they're pulling the, they release the tension on the outside of the mold now, pulling it off. And you can see from the, the view here, it's uh, unmitigated. You can see just a little transition where they had different batches, but uh, apparently that's not an issue. It's all done while the concrete was still very wet, plastic. So, and you can see they lift it right away and take it to where it's going to go. Uh, basically, let's move on to other major types of green cement. One of them is calcium sulfo aluminate, uh, calcium aluminate, activated glass, magnesium phosphate, and geopolymers. I'm just going to give a little bit of an overview because there are obviously there are people in this audience and in the world who are uh, experts in these kinds of things. And commercial sulfo aluminate clinkers are developed by Chinese, they say. And that's what the literature says. There may be people here who uh, want, to, want to debate that. Uh, also known as Klein's compound and uh, uh, alpha C2S, 15-25%, and then obviously part of it's B-Lite C2S, rich uh, sulfur aluminate cement, referred to as A-Lite rich, and so on. So um, obviously this has been studied quite a bit. These, these cements have been around quite a long time. Uh, some of you are probably familiar with uh, regulated set cements, uh, type K cements, and so on. They basically all are forms of calcium sulfur aluminate cements. And um, they, they've been used for quite a long time. A lot of them were used initially for the shrinkage compensating capabilities, but they also are used for uh, rapid hardening. Uh, one of the, I took this off of, off of one of our audience member members' website. I hope he doesn't hold this against me. Uh, they were invented in, in the early 1900s, uh, excuse me, to, to uh, calcium aluminate. Let me go back to calcium sulfur aluminate. Uh, there have been cases where people used calcium sulfur aluminate cements for uh, the rapid hardening aspects and they got uh, such good improvements that they were able to get uh, move the jobs along so that they got quite a, quite a good uh, return on their investment and early completion bonuses on several projects. So it has been utilized in that regard uh, so amount. Uh, calcium aluminate cements were invented in the early 1900s to resist sulfate attack. And uh, they're inherently rapid hardening and can be rapid setting, adjustable with uh, chemical admixtures. They're often used in refractory applications and building chemistry and rapid repair. And uh, rehabilitation and construction of flat work, they're used in other applications as well, such as uh, uh, cements which require the expansion and sulfate resistance. Uh, they generate significantly less CO2, as does calcium sulfur aluminate cement, than ordinary Portland cement. Uh, CACs are about 50% less. Uh, however, there is a downside to CAC cements, and the controversial aspect is the uh, process known as conversion. 
So when someone is going to design a building or a beam or some part of a structure, uh, if you're going to use CAC cements, you have to design for the strength after the conversion. Uh, so so that, that's one of the downsides of it. So a lot of times it is not used in structural aspects. Uh, simply for that reason, it's used a lot of times more in repair aspects. Magnesia phosphate cements is going to be another discussion on this, so I'm not going to dwell on this. But basically, they are characterized by very high early strength and rapid setting. It makes them useful as rapid patching mortars. And it also can bind very well to aggregates and substrates. Uh, recycled glass. Uh, this is a fairly new one, uh, but apparently it's working. Uh, it's a high concentration of amorphous silica and soda lime glass. And the fineness of the glass has a significant impact on its reactivity. So I believe there's a more discussion on that as well. However, this is all changing the foundation of the cement industry. These new cements, uh, a lot of them have been around in one form or another for quite a few decades. Uh, some of them are fairly new, but the, the activated uh, flash has been around. Uh, there was one in, in the uh, late 70s, early 80s called Pyramid, and uh, the company that's making them actually had financial difficulties, not because of that, but for other reasons. And uh, so they, the, a lot of people just moved on. But it, it is here to stay, and it's a very viable way of, of doing business, as, as our calcium sulfur illuminates, calcium uh, illuminates, and so on. Are there any questions? Come up to the mic, please. Uh, Jeff is also uh, kind of our champion for green cements within SDC. He's heading up that team. So very knowledgeable, pulling together a lot of people that are doing more sustainable cements. Okay. Yes. Um, very interesting talk. I was curious, in one of your early slides, you said that the cement was made from 95% waste materials. Yes. That, that's just uh, the cementitious component, correct? It's not all the concrete, it's just the fly ash and whatever activator that you're using to replace for the Portland cement? Yes, that 95% is a combination of fly ashes uh, could be part fly, but generally with our mixes, it's a combination of fly ashes, mostly class C. The other 5% are is the activators and modifiers. Okay. And, and the rest of it then, obviously, is the uh, aggregates and, and water. Sure. Which those wouldn't be recycled? The, the, the same as, and it, it could be recycled aggregates. Right. Uh, so the, the rest of it, the aggregates are the same as you would use in any of concrete. Okay. So as a follow-up to that, um, I'm curious if there, if you know if there have been any life cycle assessments done on this cement versus ordinary Portland cement, because although uh, global warming potential is one environmental impact category, and CO2 is one component of global warming potential, it's good to focus on that, but I'm wondering if you've done any research on the additional environmental impacts and how they differ compared to ordinary. I don't think the kind of study that you're probably are talking about, but as as a uh, in general, with the fly ash cements, they generally are fairly carbon neutral, 95% carbon neutral, and the other other cements, uh, calcium sulfur illuminates, calcium illuminates, the recycled glass obviously have a much lower uh, carbon emission to produce them than they would uh, than they would say uh, Portland cement. Yeah, the the. Um the potential issue with that is that in the U.S., the carbon accounting is such that the CO2 impact goes onto the coal-fired power plants, but in Europe and the rest of the world, those are actually allocated to the cement industry. So it's not as um, it, it's good to focus on the other environmental impacts as well. I think so, I, and I, yeah, you raise a good point. And the the carbon is one aspect of, of that and one of the things that we're doing to jump ahead just a little bit to our uh, strategic development council green or sustainable cements team is that one of the things that we wish to do is to develop a an index of this and, and so uh, maybe we should ask for a volunteer to be on the team. <laughs> so anyway but a, a great idea thanks Thank you, Jim.
Uh, if there are other questions, the speakers will be here after the session. You can come up and ask some questions after, but I want to keep on schedule. So thank you, Jim. Appreciate it.